Okay, so we shall uh, start uh, right on uh, right on time. So this is the first um, the first uh, talk of a series of um, uh, talks, uh, um, a seminar series on cognitive robotics. And um, as you may know, this is in the context of a cognitive robotics module of uh, Queen Mary. But of course. We open this to everyone who is interested, and in fact, I'm seeing already in the in the list uh, many attendants from uh, from different places. And um, this has been now recorded, and it will be later available for anyone who's uh, who's interested. Uh, so today, I'm very happy to have uh, Yuki Nagai with us. She's um, she's currently professor at the University of Tokyo. And uh, she has been in a few different places doing research in the past, uh, both uh, in Japan and in Europe. And she's, um, because of the uh, quality of her research, which is, uh, uh, which is amazing, I think, uh, she's uh, very well known in the international community of cognitive robotics. And uh, I particularly like the fact that what she has been doing in these years uh, tackles both main objectives of cognitive robotics, which is to uh, create intelligent robots, taking inspiration from uh, biology and the human brain, but also to really understand more about the human intelligence by creating computational models that can be uh, also tested with the robots. So really she works on both hands to have impact both in scientific impact about uh, understanding more about ourselves and um, engineering impact in uh, creating smart robots. And uh, yeah, so um, I will not spend so much time in uh, introducing and uh, I will leave the floor to Yuki, who was already here sharing a screen. So uh, you can start uh, in time. Thank you very much, Yuki. Thank you very much, Robin. So, and good afternoon or good evening. <laughs> my name is Yuki Nagai, and uh, I'm working here in Tokyo. It's my great honor to have the uh, very first talk in this uh, talk series. I'm working in their uh, cognitive robotics for about their two decades, and then uh, I got to know Lorenzo already the, like um, ten years ago, and then we are very very good friend. We both there, uh, visit there each lab, and then we have a lot of their uh, interest and also the shared their uh, ideas. So it's my great honor to explain what we are currently working in their uh, cognitive robotics, and especially the uh, my the research interest is now focusing on the predictive coding theory, which is known as a unified theory for the human brain. So I hope that, that you can learn how the human brain and how the children's brain works to learn the new cognitive, new cognitive abilities. And then there also how we can design their computational neural networks so that the robot can learn the cognitive capabilities like in human children. So let me start with their uh, explaining a bit more motivation of my research. My research interest is in their, uh, especially their early development, especially from the first periods of life in the uh, cognitive development. As you know that the human children are born with very immature capabilities. They don't even know how they can control their body. For example, here you can see that the child learned to manipulate an object and then their achievement goal in an intentional manner. And then once the children acquire the abilities to control their own body in an intentional manner, they can also learn to communicate and collaborate with other persons. In order to collaborate with others, they also have to uh, infer the intention or the goal of another person and then make an, uh, helping the behaviors in order to uh, collaborate with, achieve the goal. Now the open question is, what neural mechanism drives their human cognitive development? We know that their human children acquire the world of cognitive abilities in the first few years of life. 
And the important point here is that their, their abilities are linearly connected. So first, once their children acquire their uh, sensory motor behaviors, which is rather than non-social behaviors, this non-social behaviors becomes their basis for their emergence of the social behavior. Without the abilities to uh, control their body first in an intentional manner, they also cannot read the intention of the persons or their, uh, communicate with others. So the first question here is that how the social capabilities would emerge based on the non-social behaviors. And in order to better understand the cognitive development in human children, we also have to pay attention to the second aspect of the development, which is their individual diversity. We know that there are some children shows their typical their developmental trajectories, whereas other children shows their atypical developmental trajectories. For example, children with autism spectrum disorders shows their difficulties in communicating with others, like in reading intentions or making eye contact and so on. The question is, what, again, the causes such an atypical development? What is there a neural mechanism which uh, exhibit the diversity between the individualities? And we think that there must be a unified principle a unified the hypothesis which would be able to explain both their continuity in the development from non-social to social behaviors and also the individual diversity in the development the difference between the typical development and atypical development so what can be their potential their unified principle for the human brain and then we first looked at their neuroscience study because there are many studies that are suggesting that the human brain has a unified mechanism. Here, we introduce the idea of predictive coding. The key idea of predictive coding is that the brain, our brain works as a predictive machine. For example, when we perceive the world, we receive the sensory signals from our senses, like a visual, auditory, tactile senses. But we don't simply rely on this bottom-up sensory signal, but we rather integrate the top-down, the predictive signals from the internal model. This internal model had been acquired from our previous experiments, previous experiences, and also there are uh, generated using their other the modalities signals. And then this the predictive coding theory suggests that this internal model plays an important role to make a predictions about our sensory signal. And then it tries to minimize the prediction error. So the prediction error is here is calculated as a difference between the top-down prediction and bottom-up sensory signal. And this prediction error, it utilized to update the internal model to refine their uh, model, their representations so that their model or the brain can make a better the perception about the world. And one more important, the idea of the predictive coding is that the action generation, the action generation is also explained as a process of minimizing the prediction error. So here you can see their motor output. So from this box that we can receive the proprioceptive sensation as a sensory signal from our body. And then the predictive coding theory suggests that this internal model makes the predictive signal about the proprioceptive sensation. And then the error between the sensory signal and the predicted signal is utilized to update the motor output, which result in the action execution. So in this way, the predictive coding theory explains how our brain perceive the world and also act on the environment through the decision of prediction data, which are so-called perceptual inference and active inference process. And I also would like to introduce one more important the ideas here, which is the Bayesian uh, brain hypothesis. 
the neuroscientists additionally suggest that this predictive processing follow the base oven. So here the sensory signal is represented as a red Gaussian distribution. The uh, variance of the Gaussian distribution corresponds to the noise of the sensory signal. And the top-down prediction, the player prediction is also represented as a uh, yellow Gaussian distribution here. The player also has some uncertainty. That's why this the Gaussian distribution has a variance. And then there, according to the uh, Bayesian plane hypothesis, our posterior is or perception is created by integrating their sensory signal, the likelihood, and the player prediction according to their uncertainty. In this way, their perception is created in order to uh, better perceive the world and also uh, act on the environment through the minimization of the prediction. So I'd like to give you one example to demonstrate how your brain also works as a predictive machine. This is a very well-known uh, optical illusion. Here the question is, which area, area A or area B, looks lighter? I guess many of you will perceive that the B looks a little bit lighter than A because B is corresponding to the white region in the checkerboard. So even if it's in shadow, B must still look lighter. This is a kind of the, uh, common the perceptions as many of you will also perceive. However, if you carefully look at the physical level, physical stimuli level, you recognize that this two, these two regions, region A and B, have the exactly the same lightness. So now I introduce the two graver, which has the uh, solid the gray color. And now you can compare that the region A and region B have exactly the same lightness. So this demonstrates that your brain, if you perceive that the B looks a little bit brighter than A, your brain utilizes your top-down knowledge about this checkerboard, about this checkerboard. You did not simply rely on the incoming sensory signal. That's why your perception was a little bit biased by their uh, in knowledge about environment. So I hope this their optical illusion nicely there can demonstrate to you that how your brain, that everyone's brain works in a predictive machine, then here in the next part, I'd like to introduce our computational the modeling approach to uh, verify our hypothesis, how the development of the social behavior would uh, emerge based on the non-social sensory motor learning. And then in the second part, I will explain the, our computational model about the individual diversity. So first, I'd like to give you one example. What kind of behaviors we are targeting as a social behavior? As in a social behavior, here we are looking at the altruistic behavior or helping behaviors. This is an experiment conducted at the Max Planck Institute. The researchers investigated when and how children start helping other person. In this experiment, this experimenter always fails in achieving the goal. Here, there he dropped a clothing on the floor and it tries to report. it. As you can see, children are so kind and they are very naturally motivated to help the other persons. And here, the important point is that this experimenter never looks at the child or never give the social feedback or reward to children. Nevertheless, children are so strongly motivated to help others to achieve the goal. So the question is where this ability comes from? What is the motivation for children to help others? We thought that the mirror neuron would play an important role first to infer the intention of other persons and even further helping another person. 
The mirror neurons are originally found in the motor cortex, and there as a neurons motor cortex, it's known that the neurons activate to produce their actions to the internal world. The important point here is that the neurons in the motor cortex activate also when the monkey or the person are observing the another person's behavior. Here is our experiment the researchers conducted. So, and then this raster plot showing the, how the monkey's motor cortex neurons activated. These raster plots suggest that not only when the monkey generates its own reaching action, but also when the monkey observes the reaching action of by the human, the same neurons activate in the same manner. And then based on this finding, the researchers suggest that, that our neurons has abilities to utilize our own sensory motor experiences to better perceive and then are estimate the goal of another person. And then we, inspired by this the neuroscience evidence, we designed the computational neural network model to uh, simulate how the, how the robot can also acquire a mirror neuron-like mechanism. Here we introduced a deep auto encoder. As you know, the deep auto encoder has large, the uh, higher dimensions for input and output layers, and then lower dimension for the middle layer. And then the task of the deep auto encoder is to reconstruct the original input signal to the output layer. And using this deep auto encoder, we let the robot learn to reach for an object first through their its own motor generation. So through this the motor generation, the robot here can perceive their visual signal from the camera image, the tactile signal from their hand, and also the proprioceptive signal. So we use by the three modality signals. And then the network were trained using their back propagations which corresponding to their prediction error minimization because their output of this network is the reconstructed or the predicted signal. The training of reaching behavior itself is not so difficult. We can just provide the three modality signals and then network the update the network, the connecting weight through their uh, back propagation. The interesting point is the next step how this network can be utilized to estimate the goal of another robot reaching behavior. So after we train this network, we read the robot, the network, the, uh, the robot which trained the network, just observe the another robot reaching behavior. So here the green robot is reaching for an object and the blue robot with the deep auto encoder is just observing. Observation means that this blue robot can receive only visual signal, no tactile, no proprioceptive signal. But as this deep auto encoder acquired March model representation in the middle layer through the learning, so we could expect that the network can predict not only visual signal, but also tactile and proprioceptive signal, which are associated with the visual signal. And then this Imaginary signal can be utilized as a next time step, the imaginary input, to facilitate the further estimation of the visual signal. In this way, this network can work as a, like a mirror neural system. After training its the more, more sensory motor behaviors, the robot can utilize its own their sensory motor representations while observing another robot, another robot behaviors. Okay, so in order to uh, confirm that there, our ideas works uh, in a, as an, uh, according to the hypothesis, we conducted an experiment where we uh, designed the two learning conditions. In one condition, we train the network through action generation. So the robot received the three modality signals to train the network. In another condition, the robot learned through only the observation, which means that only the visual signal was utilized for learning. So here, by comparing these two graphs, 
especially the green bars corresponding to the collect goal prediction, you can see that the action generation could achieve higher performance than the action observation condition. The green bar has the significantly higher than the uh, one in the action observation. And then in order to see how the network representation achieved or the contributed to the better performance, we analyzed their uh, internal representation of the network. We apply the principal component analysis to their middle layer of the opt encoder, and then they visualize the activation of their three reaching behaviors. And here in the left side, you can see that three, they're very clearly structured green, uh, three colorful lines, which corresponds to the different reaching behaviors. So from this that's very clearly structured the internal representation, you can imagine that the network can more easily predict or estimate their next time step information. On the other hand, if you look at the right side, you can see that their three lines are not well structured, although they are separated, but there is no clear structure, meaning that this network has difficulties uh, in their generalizing their abilities and also sometimes miss or uh, estimated their intention goal. So then this their experimental result for showing that how their abilities of prediction and also the predictive learning could uh, can enable robots to acquire the mirror neural systems. And then we next they applied the same idea, the, sorry, the, we extended their network model to see whether the robot can also generate their helping behavior in this scenario, the robot was already learned to uh, achieve two tasks. One is to cover the red marker, the other is to push the blue cup. And then the humans also now tries to achieve one of the goal, but he fails. An interesting point here is that the robot always observing the human behaviors and then calculate the prediction error the discrepancy between the predicted state and actual state. As I said, the robot already learned to achieve the two goals. So always the predicted state is the achieved their tasks. However, the humans always fail in achieving the goal. So the discrepancy is detected by their actual state and the predicted state. And this prediction error here plays an important role to trigger the robot's own action. Their action generation is also uh, triggered at the process of prediction error minimization. With this experiment, we can suggest that the behaviors of helping another person can be triggered or can be generated by the very simple mechanism that's in a prediction error minimization. In other words, the social behavior, like an uh, altruistic behavior, does not always require the social motivation in the beginning. Maybe in the, only in the later stage of the development, the robot would need to the social feedback to learn this as a social behavior. But the pro-social behavior may not need such a social motivation yet. And then we now extended the ideas to the another different task that is the emotion estimation. And then we uh, verified whether the, our hypothesis based on the predictive coding can also explain their emotion development and emotion estimation. Here in this scenario, the robot, they're uh, sitting in face to face with the human and the human showing their emotional expression through their facial expression, hand movement, and the speech. And we here uh, introduce their March model deep belief network, which has very similar function with the deep auto encoder. But one difference is that the input layers and output layers are shared. So the input signal is coming from the bottom. And then first, the uh, invert the internal representation, and then this the raw dimensional the internal representation are utilized to reconstruct the original the input signal, and then the network is uh, updated through the minimization of prediction error. This 
is an R experiment that we conducted. So the humans is now showing the many different the facial expressions. And then the robot with their neural network model learns to uh, self-organize their internal representation. Here, this is a, a reaction of the robot, the facial expression. Using the output signal from the network, the robot can also try to estimate us, try to imitate the humans, the facial expressions. And then in the first experiment, we checked whether the emotional categorizations were acquired in our network. We know that the human adults have their like you know, sadness, anger, supplies, and so on, the different emotional categories. The question is how and when such an emotional categories are acquired as an internal representation. Here we check again to apply the principal component analysis to visualize the activation of the highest failure of the network. And as you can see from the uh, very early stage of the learning and later stage of learning, you can see that there are different emotional categories are gradually separated into the different clusters. And finally, there it is, uh, they are classified into the uh, two-dimensional spaces. The one corresponds to the alorso, and the other corresponds to the prism, which are also known as a uh, two-dimensional space for the human emotion. And please note that their network does not know which signal corresponds to the, which the emotional category. Just for the uh, visualization, we gave the label of like a fear or a sadness, but the network did not know any such not, uh, clear the training, the signals for the learning. The network just self-organized the internal representation to minimize the prediction error. And then we also found that the, how the prediction abilities of the network would help the networks to better estimate the emotional state. After training the network, we gave only their auditory signal as an input for the network and no visual signal. But as you remember from the experiment of old encoder, you can imagine that this, their network can also reconstruct an observable signal here the visual signal. And by using this reconstruction ability, we can see that the network can improve the uh, accuracy of the emotion estimation. In the very first step of the estimation, when the uh, network received only the auditory signal as an input, the estimated the emotional state was very far from the true value. But then by are repeating the reconstruction of the visual signal and utilizing this imaginary visual signal as an input, and then estimate again and again, the network could improve their estimated state, the accuracy of the estimated state. So again, this then our experiment showing that how the abilities of top-down predictions in the brain, also the network, can help our their perceptual abilities and also the how such a me uh, mechanism can be utilized to better estimate the intention of another person, which is their important role, uh, plays an important role in the social communication. So here is a, a kind of brief summary of the first part. So what we found from the first experiment is that their development, the cognitive development is described as an acquisition of prior precision. And by acquiring the prior precision, the children can better infer their, uh, better recognize the word. And by utilizing this their acquired prior, the children can also uh, estimate their missing signal in the social context. When the children observe another person, children can receive only the visual signal. But the prior, so the prior enables children to estimate the imaginary sensory signal. And with this imaginary sensory signal, their perception becomes more accurate than the previous one. So with this mechanism, we can better understand how the predictive processing itself emerges through the process of the sensory model learning. And then how this predictive processing enables children to 
generate the social behavior by utilizing the mirror neuron system. And now I'd like to now move to the individual diversity. We now know that the, how the social behaviors can develop based on the non-social, the sensory remote experiences. Now we want to see the second the aspect of the development, which is the individual diversity. As an individual diversity, here we look at the autism spectrum disorder. You know that the autism spectrum disorders have been characterized as a neurodevelopmental disorders, and they often have their social interaction impairments. For example, they cannot easily read the intention or emotional state of another person, or even making a joint to attention or eye contact. But recent studies suggest that their difficulties is lying the more in the lower cognitive abilities, like in the perceptual level. And people suggest that there are limited abilities to integrate that information to make it a global context as one of their uh, missing their abilities or their weak abilities in their uh, autism, autism their persons. And then the question is, why and how the neural mechanism would produce such differences in the cognitive abilities. We again now looked at the neuroscience their, uh, hypothesis. Here, the uh, neuroscientists suggest that their perceptual their differences between the typical development and SD can be explained as an aberrant precision of the top-down predictions. Here we utilize again the predictive coding, but the biggest difference is here is there in their Bayesian inference process. Yeah, the typical development has their kind of normal layer with some the variances, but neuroscientists suggest that persons with ASD have even weaker layer with larger variances. That's why their persons with ASD more strongly biased to the incoming sensory signal. So this is a very nice starting point. And then inspired by this hypothesis, we are again designed the computational neural network model to test whether the appellant decisions of the prior prediction would really affect the cognitive behaviors. Here we introduced the uh, recurrent neural network, which was originally proposed by the uh, mother, Ayun Juntani. And we here integrated the Bayesian inference process as a module. And one more additional, the important point here is that the recurrent neural, this recurrent neural network model can predict not only the mean of the signal, but also variance of the signal, how uh, certain or how uncertain the signal is. And using this variance value, we can integrate this Bayesian plane hypothesis here. So the uh, predicted signal with the variance is now uh, represented as a yellow Gaussian distribution. And the incoming signal is not, also has noise, which is represented as a red Gaussian distribution. And then the posterior, which becomes the input to the context layer, is now created as a posterior of the Bayesian inference. And using this model, we tested our extended hypothesis that the, not only the hypoplier, so the weak plier, but also hyperplier, very strong plier, may account for the individual diversity, including ASD. So we thought that the, if the persons, the typically developed person, has normal plier, maybe their different their difficulties in autism spectrum disorders might be explained by their both hypo and hyperplier. So we tested the manipulating the model parameters to hypo and hyperplier, and then tested how this their appellate precision would affect the learning behaviors of the network. So this is their one experiment we conducted. Here we use their uh, drawing their behaviors, drawing the time. Here there are, we designed their six different drawing patterns which were first trained with this network. And then after training, 
the network was given only with the uh, first 33% of the trajectories. And the task for the network was to complete the missing parts. For example, in this case, the eyes and mouth must be filled if the network could uh, successfully learn the patterns of the different object. Here is the trajectory. The yellow is the given trajectory, and the black is the predicted trajectory by the network. And then the green shows the further predictions by the network for the missing parts. If the network was successful, the network could nicely the complete the missing parts. And then again, the, here the question is how the modification of the player prediction would affect the learning performance. Here we utilize the parameter H in order to manipulate the variance of the network. Here is the result. So when we first utilized the very normal Player decisions. We could observe that the network were very successful in completing the missing parts. Then, when we utilized very low value for the H parameter, you can see that the network often misinterpreted the intended patterns. For example, this drawing was intended for car, but the network drew face because the contour of the car and face were similar to each other. Or in another case, the locket was looked like a human, so sometimes the network was confused between the human and locket. This can be verified by analyzing the internal representation of the network. Here is again the principal component analysis of the context layer of the network. And as an example, I show you the trajectories of the three drawing patterns face, house, and flower. You can see that the H equal one, this network, were nicely separated these three trajectories, whereas the network with H equal 0 0.001 was often uh, acquired, they're very they're confused, the trajectories for the face and the house, because their trajectories were similar to each other. And then the last condition there, when the H value was very high, which corresponded to the hypoplier, you can see that the network was very not so successful in their drawing the missing parts. They often failed in achieving the goal and then did the scribbling. You can also see that there, there was no attractor in the network. This is a result of very weak hypopliers. And then the question again is that whether these differences can be also observed in human children. In this experiment, we did not have their autism children, but there we could see some of their individual diversities in the children. So we compared our network result with the children drawing in order to further verify our hypothesis. So in this experiment, we designed a very similar drawing experiment with their uh, model studies. We gave only a part of the drawing patterns, like in the contour of the face, contour of the car, and then asked children to draw whatever they want. So you can see that some children were very successful, but some were not. These are the examples. So there, uh, you can see that the young children, like in the 30, 40 month old children, were not so good at drawing the missing parts yet. They just did the scribbling. Only their older children were successful in completing the missing parts. Just for your interest, you can also see the work, how the adult would also react to this task. And then in order to uh, more closely investigate the correspondences between the model study and the child study, we are uh, analyzed, quantitatively analyzed the, our, the, sorry, the behavior result. In the first analysis, we asked the adult raters to evaluate how well children completed the missing parts. You can see that their adult rating the gradually increases, indicating that their completion abilities in drawing gradually improved as their children get older. The interesting point is that how the internal representation of their drawing also develops with age. We, of course, cannot directly assess their internal representation, 
but by analyzing the drawing, there are differences. We can see how clearly separate the how children clearly separate the different object. This matrix were created by uh, checking the activities of the deep convolutional neural network. This deep convolutional neural network was pre-trained with natural image, and then using this network, we observed how the uh, child drawing their patterns would activate the highest layers. And this matrix shows that difference in their activations between the two different their object patterns. And yellow meaning that the two different patterns are more clearly separated, whereas darker color indicating their object were not separated. As you can see that with the increase of the age, the children acquired the different classes or categories of the object as an internal representation. By analyzing their drawing pattern, we can see the kind of their, uh, categorical representation of the object in the child. And then they, again, uh, I'd like to briefly they're summarize the second part of the, our findings. So how the individual the diversity can be explained by the predictive coding. In the first model study, we observed that there are differences or modifications in the player precision would affect the drawing behaviors. In case of normal player, the network was very successful in drawing their missing parts. And in case of hyperpliers or hyperpliers, or net network were often they failed in achieving the goal. And interestingly, we found nicely corresponding children's behavior. The completion, completing drawing were often observed in older children, and the scribbling were often observed in younger children. So one uh, summary or one conclusion who, from our from our experiments is that the development of the drawing abilities can be explained as a process to acquire the player from the hyperplier to normal player, which nicely analogous to the first experiment. And additional interesting finding is that we could also observe that like a hyperplier type children. Some children often stick to a certain drawing patterns. For example, this liked to draw flower he always drew flower regardless of the input scene. Or another boy always drew circle, triangle, and cross marks regardless of the input. So we suggest that this behavior is really similar to the one we observed with hyperplier because the hyperplier network also often stick to a certain behavior path regardless of the input signal. So maybe there are some children's their individual differences might be explained as an hyper flyer their precision. Although this was like an, uh, different from what we originally expected, because we thought that the development should occur there as a change from hyper flyer to normal flyer. But it seems that some children also possess the hyper flyer cases. So we hope that we can further investigate their uh, trajectories of the cognitive development through their process of the predictive coding, their process of acquisition. So let me conclude. Though I started with the ideas or the question is the, what is their unified principle for the human cognitive development? And then I suggested that the predictive coding plays an important role in their cognitive development, not only for their explaining adult brain, but also the process of the cognitive development, how children acquire social behaviors based on non-social sensory motor experiences, and also why the children have some individual diversities, like an autism spectrum disorders. Although our model study could not cover the whole aspect of their development or the individual diversity, but Part, to some extent, the, our model could explain and also replicate 
the development of continuity and also the individual diversity. If you are interested in the further details, I would recommend to read my the recent papers, uh, which summarizes the basic idea of predictive coding. And just for the uh, as a very last the part, I also would like to introduce what we are currently doing. So we now implemented our predictive coding model into the robot so that the robot can generate its behavior in a social interaction. We know from the study, uh, from the cognitive, cognitive science study, that the social context affects our predictive processing. Humans become more sensitive to the incoming sensory signal rather than the top-down prediction in the social context. But the question is why? So in order to better investigate the effect of the social interaction, we now started this the human robot interaction experiment where the robot can show the drawing behaviors in response to the humans the drawing. This is just a simple demonstration to show how the robot can do the drawing with the touch screen. Unfortunately, the, our iCAD cannot really touch the screen, so we just to provide the output signal to both the display and the item, the hand movement, so that you can see as if the robot is drawing. But with this setup, I hope that we can better the, uh, further investigate the underlying mechanism of the predictive coding in the social context. So thank you very much for your kind attention, and then I'm happy to receive your question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Yuki. Uh, that was uh, very interesting. Uh, right, I I open the floor to questions. If if you have any question, either type it or um, raise your hand, and I will um, and you can then pose your question live. Um, I will um, I will maybe start with one uh, a bit general, but related to your to the second part of your talk. Uh, mm -hmm. So you you saw this difference between uh, 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 older and uh, and younger uh, children. Do you uh, do you see this as a, um, so? Do you think this difference is related to a, a different developmental stage, uh, like a specific developmental stage, which is different between the older children and the younger children, and whether mm -hmm. Uh, such a difference in the development is also reflected in other skills. Uh, yeah, thanks. So I think the first the hypo players should are strongly related to the age because we could clearly see that the younger children often show their scribbling behaviors, which are very similar to the hypo player. And also mathematically, it makes sense because the younger children have less experiences. So the accuracy of their internal model is still very low. So that's why their player naturally become their have their higher their variances. So the one the process, the main process of the development would be explained as a change from hypo player to normal player. But the kind of surprising result is that there are some children's behavior regardless of the age looks similar to they're very similar to the hyper flyer type. Some children have a very strong intention or preferences, and then regardless of the input signal, they often behave in the same way. They are not autistic children, but then they were very like to behave in the same manner. So we are not sure yet how the process of the development can also go to the hypo to hyper flyer. But one possibility is that there, even in one person, their, uh, the strongness of the flyers can adaptively change depend on the context or depend on the task, which is also they're reported by the person with autism spectrum disorders. They say that they sometimes have hyper sensory sensitivity, and also that they, in another context, they also have their hypo, uh, hypo sensitivity to the sensory signal. So the one person can have the both hypo and hyper, and then switch between them. The point is that how this uh, switch between hypo and hyper flyers can be easily done 
between the uh, in their typical development and the autism spectrum disorder. That is still we don't know yet, and we are very much interested to further investigate this direction. I see, I see, yeah, indeed, very interesting. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, Kaspar would like to ask a question, so please. Hi, hi, yeah, thanks for the very nice presentation. Uh, I'm Kaspar Altefer from Queen Mary. Um, so yeah, very interesting. I, I'm just wondering. I mean, you you have decided on on these H values there to distinguish mm -hmm. between hyper priors and the normal ones and the hyper ones. But I mean, couldn't there be also a range where maybe you have I mean a H of twenty or a H of zero point one? I mean, how would that impact? Mm -hmm. On, on the behavior. What is your view on that? Mm. Actually, the way they uh, manipulated the age value in a more, the, how can I say, the, in a small range, small changes. So not only these three conditions, but we had like um, 10 conditions in between. Just to uh, emphasize the differences, I picked up these three conditions. So, but then that uh, modifications in the hypo or in the hyper priors looks very similar. Just increases their influences of the hypo and the hyper players. Okay, okay, good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can just add another question. Now you mm -hmm. you 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 did, didn't lo look at the autistic children um, mm -hmm. but found some behavior in young children that were not autistic that had that, that was different let's say from other children. I'm wondering, could you actually use your neural networks to predict what kind of images could come, mm -hmm. um, you would put, um, you know, be produced by children who are use, you are in the, in the category of the hyper priors? Because, because you have now data from, from your, your, your hyper priors and from your normal priors, maybe you could, you know, uh, use that to from the, the results you have there to predict what pictures should come from autistic children. Is that possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. We expect that the hyper player type can be uh, observed from the autistic children because the, you, you may know that the autistic children often show the repetitive behaviors. They can always jumping or always turning. It's like an from my point of view, it looks like a uh, very strong top-down, their intentions. So they are somehow ignoring their incoming sensory signal, but they always keep the same state. It's a kind of very strong attractor in their behavior patterns. And then the, we think that these their hyper priors might correspond to such an repetitive behaviors. So regardless of the input signal, children do always show their same behavior patterns. So also that if you look at their internal representation, you can see that uh, these two lines are closely the overlapping. Oh. So which actually create a very strong attractor in their uh, this, the spaces. So then the once their network go into this attractor, it also becomes very difficult to escape from the attractors which would result in their repetitive behaviors in case of their uh, motor behaviors. So we think or we expect that if we can conduct a similar drawing experiment with children with autism, we would observe like in similar patterns like this. That would be the one their uh, expectation of the observation. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering whether it would be also possible to kind of predict with your networks what kind mm -hmm. of images will come out of it. I mean, I, I, I know you want mm. to go lo look at all, all autistic children and, and you assume that it will be similar to what you see on the left hand side there, but could you actually predict this with your the mm. algorithms that you have and the data that you get from other children? Mm, yeah. yeah, that would be interesting if we can really uh, make a prediction about their behaviors. Yeah. Just, just also, because because, that, because then then you would have another mm -hmm. kind of proof that your neural network is doing something some, something useful there. Yes, sure. Yeah, thank okay. you very much for a very nice comment. Thank you, thank you, very nice. Thanks. Uh, thank yeah, you. so there is a follow-up question from uh, Mohamed who typed it on the chat 
on whether uh, actually this could be also used then uh, so this kind of information this kind of prediction can be used to uh, to create uh, drawings that could help uh, children to somehow uh, improve in their conditions let's say or in mm -hmm. their development mm -hmm. yeah one the ideas of this whole their experiment is to find out there what is the critical the core mechanism for the autism children we know that the autism children have the many different difficulties not only drawing also the social communication or be their motor behaviors and so on. but we think that there are there one shared mechanism producing the many different types of their behavior characteristics and then the potential their uh, mechanism is this the predictive coding the ability appellant precision of the predictive processing and then we believe that once we can find out this the core mechanism based on the predictive coding, we can assist in changing the way of integrating the sensory signal and the top-down predictions. We are not sure, we don't have the clear idea yet, but one idea, one approach is to uh, design the feedback system, neurofeedback or biofeedback system. And then by providing the feedback of the process of this the predictive processing, we hope that, that we can assist the uh, way of the perception and the actions in the autistic children. Yeah, thank you. Any other question? Uh, yeah, sorry, um, I was lost for a second. Uh, yeah, there was a follow-up question on whether this will depend on the severity of the condition uh, of the autism uh, spectrum, which I guess is probably the case. So could you repeat the question? Uh, well, uh, whether the, the um, well, there was a question on whether, uh, how much this will depend on the severity of the uh, autism mm. spectrum condition. Mm. The, my current hypothesis, it, although it's still simple, is that there are uh, in the spectrum that we can uh, explain in a different way. So there, According to our result, we can hypothesize that the autism spectrum is now there explained as a two extreme of the autism cases. Mm -hmm. So the traditional spectrum says that the typical development on the one hand and the autism is on the another hand. This is the spectrum, traditional spectrum. Mm -hmm. We hypothesize that the typical development is placed in the middle of spectrum. And then two different types of their difficulties appears as a two different types of the autism, according to this the hypo and the hyper bias. And then the severities of the autism might also respond to their uh, apparent their modifications in the prior predictions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I don't have any the evidence yet, but there, yes, that yeah. would be the one potential hypothesis. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, I would maybe like to ask uh, another small thing about the first part of the talk. Uh, w something I got from, in general, from your talk is that uh, you you are saying that basically there might not be a specific internal drive for um, mm -hmm. for young children to 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 start social behaviors or to make social behavior emerge but that this drive is something that is related to the general way in which we understand external stimuli. Mm. Is, is that what you're saying somehow? Yes. And, and if that's the if, case also, yeah. if uh, sorry, also whether that is something we observe in other species, in other animals, uh, mm. rather than just humans. Yeah, I think that there are uh, this the process that minimization of prediction error in terms of the action generations can nicely explain their emergence of the social behaviors mm -hmm. or any kind of the behaviors. Because the, this 
the mechanism, the active inference mechanism does not require any the social their motivation or social representation yet. It just tries to minimize the prediction error. But then they, this nicely explained that because in social context, we cannot predict another person's the behaviors. We always see some prediction errors because our internal model and another person's internal models are quite different. So the outcomes of the another person's behaviors is not always the predictable. And then there are, yes, the, and then the, based on this, there are uh, detected the prediction error between their self predicted state and the, another person's the behavior outcome. Their prediction error can trigger their own motor behaviors to generate an action, which can be regarded as an emergence of the social behavior. So, although that we have the, only the one example to show here as an artist behavior, but we think that, like, for example, the imitation behaviors can be also that are explained by this their prediction error minimization. And then they, uh, maybe their uh, speech communication can be also explained as a process of minimization of prediction error. Because we don't know each other perfectly. That's why we ask the questions to better understand another person and better run the internal model of another person. And by making the questions and receiving the answer, we can gradually reduce our prediction error about the, another person. That is the motivation of our communication. Yeah, it sounds, sounds very, very interesting. Um, I know we, we finished the, the hour, but if, if that's all right, there is maybe another question. If you have a few more, yes. a few minutes. Sure. Um, yes. There was a question by Tom about uh, uh, to what extent do you think uh, different uh, cognitive behaviors, for example, in the autism uh, spectrum, are related to different uh, sensory precision, precisions rather than the mm -hmm. different uh, way in which uh, the information is represented? So you mean that not all about their uh, plier pred? Right, so not, the, just, not just on the combination between uh, the prior mm -hmm. and the posterior and the um, sensing, but also on the precision of the sensing, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, actually a very good point. And uh, actually, we further extend this hypothesis because uh, well, even when, when we say that uh, it's a hyper plier, but if their sensory, the precision is also very high, so both have the very high precision. In that case, their hyperplier would work in a very different way in this context. So then there, we now extended this their axis into kind of two dimension. In one dimension, we modulate the plier precision. In another dimension, we modulate their sensory precisions. And then we recently just observed that they're in this two dimensional space that we can observe the different, slightly different the difficulties in case of their uh, abnormal, their precisions. So I don't clearly uh, remember the result yet because it's just very, very recent result, just a few days ago I just got to that. But we can see that the different effect of the sensory precisions compared to the fly precision. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, all right. Uh, I think, um, yeah, I don't see any more question at the moment. So uh, thank you. Thank you again very much, Yuki. It was, uh, I think it was very interesting. And uh, just a quick comments for the, uh, for the master students of uh, my cognitive robotics module. Surely you have seen uh, some, um, uh, some connections between what Yuki presented today and what we discussed in a previous lecture about uh, the important role of prediction and also the way in which development changes the way in which we use our internal brain structure to make sense of reality. So uh, hopefully you will be able to make the links between these uh, things that we have seen today. And um, yeah, thanks again, Yuki. And um, this will be available for later to watch later for anybody if they want. And uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> See you around, hopefully. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much for the invitation. Yeah.
Thank you, thank you from my <coughs> sorry. Thank you also from my side. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Bye. When yeah. you have a chance to come to Tokyo, please visit our lab. You are very welcome. Yes, I think that would be a pleasure. Yeah. yeah, as soon as you are able to do it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Have to wait for, uh, for the end of COVID. Yes. Yes. <laughs> bye, bye. See you later. Okay, and thank everybody bye -bye. for uh, for attending and making questions. Bye, everyone. <laughs>